Can you build a gaming PC without a dedicated graphics card in 2021? And if so, how much gaming performance can you really get out of it? Let's figure it out. I have five different AMD CPUs with built-in Radeon graphics, from the two-core Athlon 3000G to the eight-core Ryzen 7 4700G, and I tested a dozen games on each of them. Let's see how they performed. Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ, and I'm sure you're getting tired of every tech YouTuber starting every video by mentioning the horrible state of the PC component market, particularly the complete unavailability of graphics cards. I know, I get it, I'm right there with you. I can't get a new GPU either, and Unfortunately, some recent news coming from TSMC indicates things aren't gonna change for the foreseeable future. So what can you do in the meantime if you want or need to build a new gaming rig? Well, there are several options. You can get on eBay and pay a scalper for a GPU, not recommended. If you're lucky enough to have a brick and mortar within driving distance, like a micro center, you can camp out and hope to score a card. I've gotten lucky with that in the past, but many have not. Or probably the best option right now is to just buy a pre-built gaming PC from a reputable system integrator. But we're not talking about any of that today. Today we're gonna see first if you can game in 2021 without a dedicated graphics card, and second, at what level. So what I have here is basically every version of internal Radeon RX Vega graphics from the 14 nanometer Vega 3 in the Athlon 3000G, the 12 nanometer Vega 8 in the Ryzen 3 3200G, the 14 nanometer Vega 11 in the Ryzen 5 2400G, the 7 nanometer Vega 7 in the Ryzen 5 4650G, and Vega 8 in the Ryzen 7 4700G. Now, this isn't every AMD CPU with integrated graphics there is. For example, I have the 4-core, four 4-thread four 3200G and not the older 2200G, but I have the older 4-core, four 8-thread 2400G as opposed to the 3400G. Because in reality, performance bump using the integrated graphics from the Raven Ridge to Picasso is minimal in most games. In fact, the gains are most entirely from the bump in CPU core performance, not from the Vega graphics, which were essentially unchanged between generations. And you probably noticed I have a couple of non-consumer OEM only APUs, the 6 core 12 thread 4650G, which is an OEM only CPU, but might as well be a consumer chip because the market is flooded with them. They're even listed on Amazon. I think they're sold out though. And until last week, the most powerful desktop APU available, the 8 core 16 thread Ryzen 7 4700G. Now, this is admittedly not easy or cheap to acquire. In fact, I bought an entire HP desktop PC just to get it, just so I could show you its gaming performance. Well, not really, but you still get the benefit from my expenditure. Anyway, I'm not gonna read through all the specs of all these CPUs. I'll leave links to the tech specs in the description if you're interested in all the clock speeds and cache capacities and so forth. Plus, I'll also be covering a lot of it as I go through the benchmark charts. Let's just jump into the performance benchmarks. All the components for the test bench or benches I used are also listed below. Now, I do need to mention while I didn't do any manual overclocking to these chips, I did enable basically every motherboard BIOS enhancement available, which meant enabling the extreme GPU boost on all the chips, enabling PBO for the 4700G and TPU2 for the 3200G and 2400G, and increasing the dedicated memory or graphics frame buffer to eight gigabytes for all of them. The 3000G is a bit different. The max frame buffer is only two gigabytes, and although it's unlocked, I couldn't overclock both the CPU and the memory, and the GPU is actually locked at 1100 megahertz, or at least it is on my test bench. I went with the stock base clock of 3.5 gigahertz and ran the memory at 3200 megahertz CL16. This was the best balance between stability and performance. 
Okay, with that out of the way, let's look at some gaming performance. I started with a few synthetic benchmarks, the first being 3D Mark Night Raid. This, as opposed to say Time Spy, is the benchmark specifically made for integrated graphics. And looking at the overall scores, you see that the 3200G comes within about 5% of the 2400G score, while the 4650G and 4700G pull ahead of the Vega 11 by 26% and 41% respectively, while the 300G doesn't really compete here. To dig into these scores a little deeper, when we look at the graphic score only, the 3200G actually beats the 2400G, and that's because despite the 2400G having three more GPU compute units, and an identical 1250 megahertz frequency as the 3200G, the ASUS motherboard was able to boost the 3200G graphics frequency about 100 megahertz higher than the 2400G, which gave it a 2% edge. However, looking at the CPU only scores, scores are more in line with core and thread count. The 3200G does have a slightly better IPC than the 2400G, but the motherboard boosted both to 4.1 gigahertz. The 4700G was able to pull 30% ahead of the 4650G, both due to the extra two cores and four threads, but also because while the 4650G is locked to its 4.2 gigahertz boost clock, PBO enabled an all core boost of 4.4 gigahertz on the 4700G. Moving on to heaven, and here I tested all the CPUs at 1080p high. Again, we see the 3200G just edges out the 2400G. And again, this is due to its slightly higher GPU speeds. The last synthetic benchmark is also the first gaming benchmark, Civilization VI. I tested this game at 1080p high presets, and I ran the built-in graphics benchmark. The results are shown in frame time, so lower is better. And again, we see the 3200G just edge out the 2400G. Okay, now I have 11 more gaming benchmarks to share and I'm just gonna let them roll without commentary. So I'll just give you the info and caveats up front. First, before each chart, I'll roll footage of the settings I used for the benchmarking and a short clip of some of the gameplay to give you an idea of where in the game I benchmarked, and so you can see the quality for yourself. The stats overlay will be up on all the clips, and all the footage was recorded using the 4650G. The 3200, 2400, 4650, and 4700G were all tested at the same exact settings, but to give it a fighting chance, I reduced the settings, all the settings, to their absolute minimum on the 3000G, and if there's an asterisk near the score on the chart, I also reduce the resolution to 1600 by 900. Just a couple of caveats for the games. First, for CSGO, I used the FPS Benchmark Workshop by, I can't pronounce his username, but this map allows for consistent benchmark runs, but is basically worst case scenario for game performance, especially as you pass through the two smoke grenades. The FPS just tanks. So while average FPS is only slightly lower than what you typically encounter in matches, the 1% lows are way, way under what's typical. I'm not sure if I'm gonna continue to use this map anymore. I've seen others, but I haven't been able to find them. If any of y'all have a better benchmark map, let me know in the comments. The next is World of Warcraft. I haven't actually played this game since probably about 2013, and I don't even have a subscription anymore, so I just downloaded the demo and ran around the opening tutorial ship scene for five minutes, scrolling the camera view in and out. I'm not sure exactly how this relates to open world gameplay, but my assumption was that if you're a WoW player, you probably do. Okay, that's it. Let's roll the charts and we'll go with the most demanding game to the least.
All right, that was a lot of gameplay and charts, but let's look at the overall average of those 11 games. And the first thing to note is the 3000G isn't really a contender here, unless you're okay with dropping the resolution to 720p, which is where it needs to be to get any decent frame rates. The 3000G is a good option for a basic home office PC, like the $300 build guide I published last year, but not really as a gaming PC. The rest of the APUs, however, performed well, all averaging over 60 FPS at 1080p. The 3200G and 2400G were essentially tied, while the 4650G outperformed them by 9-10%, to and the 4700G pulled another 7% farther ahead. So, to answer the question, can you game in 2021 without a dedicated graphics card? Yes, as long as you have reasonable expectations. You're obviously not going to be playing the latest AAA titles at high visual settings or playing anything over 1080p resolution. And unless you just have mad skills and don't need the high FPS advantage, you're not going to be super competitive in Twitch shooters. But if you play older games or pretty much any eSport type game or console ports that can be played at higher FPS on a PC, but were only really designed to be played at 30 FPS. I, I know, 30 FPS, that's PC gamer blasphemy, but really, most games built for last gen consoles were only designed for 30 FPS max. Now, where do I think the best value is on this desk? Well, in the normal world, I'd say here, but Unfortunately, the consumer CPUs, the Raven Ridge and Picasso APUs just aren't really available, or not at a reasonable price anyway. So where I think the stopgap lies is here, the Ryzen 5 4650G. It performed well, coming in within 7% of the 4700G, and at least at the time of filming, you can find them for around $300, maybe a bit more, which isn't bad considering the only stopgap GPUs you can get for a reasonable price right now are like GT 1030s, and this APU outperforms that across the board. Now, of course, you can't just order one from Best Buy or Newegg, maybe Amazon, but they aren't in stock there for long. You have to get them usually from Asia. I got mine off eBay from a seller in Korea for $265 shipped. It actually arrived within a week and came in a box with a Wraith Stealth cooler. This is the actual box it came in. This is just a, another 2400G box standing in. Now, of course, some people are weary of eBay, which is understandable. You just need to do your due diligence. Look at the seller rating and recent reviews. Also, look at the other items they have for sale and recently sold. If they've sold multiple items recently and haven't got any legitimate complaints, then you can be relatively confident in the sale. Also, as both an eBay seller and as a buyer, I can tell you that eBay heavily favors the buyer, so there aren't many situations where you can't get a refund from eBay even if the seller takes the money and disappears. Now, besides its performance on its own as a gaming APU, when you're able to get your hands on a dedicated graphics card, it's still a great 6-core 12-thread CPU. It's basically equivalent to a Ryzen 5 3600 and paired with a GPU performs almost the same. I, I say almost because it does have a reduced L3 cache size and unlike, well, all Ryzen CPUs, the multiplier is locked, so you can't overclock the CPU. However, depending on your motherboard, you can unlock the power limit and boost the GPU clock, which in my testing got me about another 100 megahertz on the CPU and 400 megahertz on the GPU. Based on the CPU performance, you can pair the 4650G with anything up to, I'd say, an RTX 3070 or Radeon RX 6800 XT. You can go higher, but over those, while you will see gains, you'll also start to run into CPU bottlenecking. Anyway, I added that 9 or 10 minutes of gameplay footage because my plan for this video was to just quickly show the benchmark charts and then build a no graphics card PC using the 4650G, but times as they are, the motherboard I had in my card is now unavailable, and the case I ordered for the build got delayed until May 10th, so hopefully that'll be a future video, so be sure to get subscribed so you can check that out. Again, links to the tech specs of all these CPUs are in the description, as well as links to any of these you can 
actually buy. If you have questions, be sure to ask in the comments. And when I do get the parts to build a PC around this, what other games would you like to see tested? Let me know. As always, if you like this, hit that like. And if you didn't, just click the dislike twice. I'll get the message. I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, stay safe.